Welcome guys to another T-Rex talk. Today we are going to be talking about, I don't know if you can kind of see, but I have a number of attachments, scopes, red dots, lights, lasers, guns, uppers, rifle. Uh, I think we can show rifles on stream. I've been told recently by a, a certain Garland thumb that I'm allowed to show guns on stream again. We'll see though, we might do that in a little bit. But I wanna take some questions today on uh, gun accessories, gun parts, and uh, maybe help you guys out with some experiences that we've had in uh, collecting a wide variety of equipment and what's good, what's not, what sucks, what's cool. Uh, probably one of the biggest discussions is, you know, are these nicer red dots uh, worth the money, you know, compared to more budget options that come out of Asia? And the answer is yes, some of these optics out here, name brand optics are more expensive. There are things about them that, uh, you know, are a little more reliable and the companies behind them have really good, you know, customer service and warranty and, you know, all sorts of other things that do make them expensive for a reason. My favorite comments, and as a, as you know, someone in a manufacturing company, my favorite comments from people when you're talking price point on stuff is, why on earth does such and such a product cost $1,000, $500, or like shot timers, stuff like that? Generally speaking, 99% of the time, these are people who don't work in manufacturing, uh, don't own a manufacturing company, and they don't understand how expensive or difficult it is to get stuff made. Uh, the levels that go into making you know, an electro optic, all the different parts, the electronics, uh, the overhead, uh, the patents involved, uh, the lawyers involved, the legal team, uh, the testing involved. Like there's a lot that goes into making an optic, which, you know, and then at the end, the price point of this optic has to ultimately pay for all that testing that occurred. Now we mostly produce cheaper products. I think one of the most expensive products we manufacture ourselves or have had made is the AC1 at $190. And even that has been a million dollar plus project to get that done. Um, so, and that's not even anything complicated. That's some sewing, you know, that's not an electro optic that's got a retain zero under full auto, 556, 762, suppressed use, unsuppressed use. Uh, that's literally just a plate carrier. So before you freak out about how expensive certain companies are charging for their product, maybe take some time to study, you know, what it actually takes to go get a product made, uh, what the testing costs. Uh, what the overhead costs, what kind of patents are out there, what kind of royalties are they having to pay for some of the technology that they're using, you know, uh, how sensors and parts are fluctuating in price. You know, sometimes stuff completely changes in price over in Asia, circuitry and electronics and whatnot. And some of these companies have to have a price point on their optics uh, to basically to eat that cost without raising the price of the optic all the time. Uh, so there's just a lot of people out there who want the best thing, the most durable, uh, that can fly, that is invincible for $100. And I'm here to tell you, that's impossible. That's not gonna happen. There's just some unrealistic expectations in the firearms world, and there's also some unrealistic expectations of what you even need, you know? What kind of durability do you actually need compared to like what the military's requesting or what law enforcement's requesting or, you know, whatever. Anyway, that's it. Be that as it may, it's a huge discussion. So, good irons can be priceless. Uh, fun fact, iron sights can fail just like red dots can in different ways, but don't think iron sights are perfectly uh, invincible. I've had plenty of iron sights on pistols fail, fly off of my gun. I've had, uh, you know, front sight post comes loose, pops right off. I've had iron sights on rifles fall apart and also, um, you know, go the way of the dodo. So don't think that irons are uh, exactly invincible because they're not. They won't run out of batteries, but that's like the only thing they got going for them. Holographic versus a red dot. So the technology between a holographic and a red dot. This is an old Aimpoint M68, which is, it looks like it's on, but the, oh no, that's the light reflection back there. The primary difference in this is how the uh, LED or how the uh, reticle is being projected onto the glass. Um, generally speaking on a holograph optic, you're able to get clear glass due to how the technology is working where the laser is being projected onto the, uh, the glass itself. Uh, you also get a more refined image usually, although some people are like, oh, the center circle, you know, around the dot is really fuzzy. Uh, but for the most part, the single MOA dot on EOTech will be much more refined than the two MOA dot on the aim point, or this might be a four MOA actually, I'm not sure, uh, but the two or four MOA. Now, due to how the technology is working in a holographic site, the battery life is a lot less, uh, just due to how the laser is pulsating, how it's being projected onto the glass. 
Uh, one thing to note on some of these red dots, you'll notice that some red dots have bluer hue, like the early gen MROs, uh, the LCO, uh, even this one right here, you can see sort of a blue hue. Um, they do that so that a, the red dot being projected into the front of the window uh, doesn't have to be as bright for it to be visible, which means you can lengthen the battery life. So on other optics where you have a really clear, you know, you don't have that tint occurring, uh, the laser is having to basically be brighter, you know, the, projecting the, uh, the dot image in the center of the window, which means the battery life is going to be less than an optic that has a really you know, harsh blue tint. Uh, kind of like on RMR, some of the older RMRs are super blue and the newer ones are like a little, little clearer. Um, so that's something folks don't understand about like battery life and stuff like that. Uh, and I don't like the blue tint at all. Like it's, it, it kind of sucks, you know, when you start like playing with it. But uh, there's a lot of things about these optics that um, are fascinating. Fascinating technology. As far as which, which to get, uh, either. They both do good things. Uh, I recently acquired the uh, new EOTech G45 5X magnifier and for this sort of magnification with this optic, I would venture to say that an EOTech with a single one MOA dot is going to be a much better bet uh, under magnification than something like a T2 with a two MOA dot. I also have here, this is kind of dandy, it's kind of hard to see there, this is the two dot EOTech. And the cool thing with this is the bottom dot is calibrated at 500 meters on a 14.5 gun, just like this R5. So in theory, when I pop this magnifier over, I can use that bottom hash, the bottom dot, as my 500 meter hold. I haven't played with this yet, haven't been, had time to go to the range this week, uh, but this combo right here might actually be uh, really awesome if you wanna sort of bridge the gap between something like a scope with an RMR or an offset mount and instead have one package right here, which is a little bit lighter and if you need to, you can pop the magnifier off and just go red dot only and you're set. It's pretty cool actually. Oh geez. Use ACOG. So ACOGs. ACOGs are one of the most durable optics on the market, besides maybe like an Aimpoint Pro. It's a fixed, generally speaking, they're a fixed three by, three and a half by, or four power optic. They come in a lot of different variations, and the reality is they don't break. It broke. <laughs> uh, they don't break. Uh, it's one of the few optics out there that you can actually treat like a hammer and just throw around and chuck around and literally like gunsmith on um, that won't actually like break and be destroyed. Unlike some of the scopes out there, the one to sixes and whatnot, where you have a lot of moving parts going on in the optic and you don't necessarily want to be throwing around because they're just a little less durable. So when people ask like, hey, what kind of optic should I, you know, I want my, my do-all, my survival rifle, my, my rifle for the bush. Uh, you know, reliability and durability is definitely something to think about and the ACOG is still quite unmatched. So as far as the ACOG, I wanna do a video on that. I wanna do a video actually talking about the ACOG. Uh, is it relevant in 2021 or 2022 by the time we film the video? In my opinion, yes it is. Uh, Cause it's still one of the most durable optics out there. It's got some of the best glass clarity for an optic for its price point. Um, it's lightweight, so when you start to combine a gun with a laser, a suppressor, a white light, and all this other stuff, I could still have magnification for target identification and, you know, easy shooting out to 400 meters, which is about how far I'm going to take one of these, you know, 5.56 guns. Um, plus, it also weighs nothing, and I can combine that with, say, where's an offset mount? You know, an offset RMR, or maybe the RMR back here, and uh, I'm set and I'm good to go. So I really like the ACOGs. This is the non-battery power, non-illuminated model, which is actually pretty cheap. I think it's like 800 bucks. Um, and then there's also the illuminated ones. This is the three power one, which I haven't had time to play with. Uh, it's a little bit smaller, a little bit more lightweight. Uh, the eye relief is quite a bit better. So I'm getting a full uh, picture about right here. So as you can see, it's about a three and a half inch eye relief. And uh, this one's pretty cool. A little less field of view, but uh, you know, <laughs> just aiming at people back in the back. Who are watching g45 versus g33 so um don't know yet i haven't used the g45 enough to have an opinion uh, i have used the g43 though this is the g43 right here this is their new three power versus the old three power and i'll tell you right now i prefer the old three power the problem with this shortened optic uh, the g43 is because it's sucked in a little more the eye relief starts to become an issue where now you actually need to run this 
further back uh, on the gun, but I usually have my red dots further forward. Whereas with the G33, I can have this place where this is butting up straight to the optic, and because this is long enough, my eye relief is already good to go. Uh, as far as glass clarity goes on both of these, uh, there was no easy discernible difference. Um, so I far prefer the G33 over the new 43. They also weigh the same. So it's not like you're saving any, you're not, you're not getting anything by using this one, uh, except for maybe there's some stuff internally they're doing that's a little different. Maybe it's more durable or something, but I haven't had that confirmed. It actually wouldn't surprise me because it's a lot more, they got a lot more stuff going on here. But uh, I still like the G33 and then the G45, which uh, matches in size, as you can see right here, um, does weigh more, it's a little bit bigger, and it's obviously in a different class of its own, being a five power uh, magnifier. I also have the aim point six by magnifier. That thing's a piece of trash. Um, that thing absolutely sucks. The eye relief is horrible. The objective is tiny. It's also like $1,200. They came out with that, I wanna say like six years ago. Uh, with a aim point T2, the dot is massive. Uh, that magnifier, I've got it around here somewhere, not great. And there's a reason you don't see anybody using them. But the new G45 is uh, fascinating, to say the least. This thing is pretty dope, not gonna lie. It does weigh a little bit though. You actually have a scale around here somewhere. I could find out exactly what it weighs, or you could just Google it. Uh, do a review. I don't really do reviews. This is about as close as I'll do to a review. We have the scale out, we're finding out what it weighs. We should compare it to the uh, G33. Let's see what it weighs. This is about as close to a review as I'll get. 12.8, and then this is 12.8, 10 All right, so it's two ounces more. That's it? Huh. Wow, feels like a little bit more, but all right, cool. So, Trichicon VCOG 1 to 8, no one is talking about the scope. Well, I have one. Um, it's been very hard to get. The reason why no one's talking about it is almost nobody has them. They've been sending them out to the Marine Corps. Uh, those are going on M27 IAR rifles. I've got one. It's a tank. There's one thing about it that I really like. Uh, it is not a traditional scope and it takes normal ACOG mounts. So you don't have to worry about leveling. You don't have to worry about making sure like it's all like squared away. It just mounts straight to an ACOG mount, you put it on the gun and you're set. That's really cool. I actually really like that versus, you know, having to worry about leveling and stuff. Downside to the scope is it weighs a lot. It's also, I think about $2,600. I'm not sure. Uh, somewhere around there. But uh, I've enjoyed using mine, but I still need to play with it more before I have much else to say. Uh, but it is a super durable, like, uh, LPVO style scope that uses uh, quali uh, quality uh, mounts, the ACOG mount, which I do really like, but um, it does weigh something. It weighs quite a bit. Aim point three X's are good. I've got one somewhere around here. I actually really like that. The six X's, and props to aim, aim point for going six power, trying to. It just didn't, it just didn't work. It would be better with an EOTech, and I've used it with an EOTech, and even then, it was too finicky. It was too wild. It just wasn't good enough. The Devo, another example of a product that could have been amazing, and I'm really thankful that Leupold tried to uh, try something new. And I, there were a lot of people on the internet who were skeptical of it. I was skeptical of it. I got one. Uh, I'm still skeptical of it after using it. The problem with the Devo is the eye box and the eye relief for the optic. It's the one where like, you look down, you see the magnification, I think it was 3X or 4X and you shoot with that, the problem was your head had to be in the exact perfect position to even see that like optic, that image, that reticle and be able to engage. And so from a bench, that's fine. Uh, from a standing position, that's fine. But if you introduce any other variables such as barriers, prone, crouched, around a thing, around a car, under a car, can't see it. It's just not gonna work. Um, but props to Leupold for trying something new. I think that product has since been discontinued. Um, I don't know, yes, no, Devo, do you know? Not to your knowledge, he doesn't know. Um, it's possible it's been discontinued, but I would like to see that technology played with in the future by another company with better eye relief, a, a better you know field of view with the optic itself, and the ability to have both you know being able to use them all at once uh, right there in one package. I think would be pretty cool. Um, but it didn't you know it didn't work out because they were uh, they were limited by the technology of their day, <laughs> however that quote goes uh, that that meme. Is that, is that ready? Josh just finished building. It's like, is this the BA? This is the ballistic advantage. So this is a ballistic advantage 16 inch gun that they sent us a while ago. And it has now just been upgraded with this uh, Criterion, not Criterion, um, Centurion. Cent same thing basically, right? Uh, Centurion arms uh, rail and uh, pretty rad. Not exactly a drop in, but it is free float. 
and uh, curves around the FSP just fine. So we originally had this uh, BCM key mod set up with the Surefire, and uh, man, this thing's this thing's hot. This thing's cool. Um, not sure if a light bar will get around the front here. I was actually really curious to test this. Well, this isn't an M-Lock one. So one of you, can one of you get me an M-Lock? It should be one over there. I want to see if this works. Very cool upgrade to a budget gun. I really like that. What do you think of hand stops? If, okay, the deal with hand, with grips and like things and you got to put your hand on is uh, if you need it, get one. If you don't need one, don't get one. Um, but the reality is, are they going to help your shooting? Not always. Uh, now where hand stops can be really helpful is on a short gun where after a reload, you don't want to extend past the muzzle and shoot yourself in the hand, like on a TP9 or, you know, some sort of weird little like seven inch three hundred blackout gun or something like that. Uh, but as far as like grips go and stuff, uh, it's really dependent on what you're dealing with, with that, you know, with your particular gun. Does it make a huge difference? No, not really. I, I don't really care when I come in here and grab a gun and go to the range. I don't care if it's got a BCM grip and a Knight's broom handle, a AFG. It doesn't really matter. I just put my hand on it and I just, and I just shoot, you know, but, uh, they, they can give you some advantages. Uh, when you're dealing with lasers and pressure pads of having a grip to kind of brace off of like this and being able to actually move your hand along it to get your actual pressure pads and activate your light and your uh, laser. That can be beneficial. That can be really nice. Uh, it just depends on the gun and what you're trying to do. But I don't think it's a, I don't think it makes a huge difference. It's not like in Call of Duty where it's, you know, like plus hip fire and, you know, minus 2%, you know, recoil, vertical recoil. That'd be awesome though if it did that. Silent buffer tube, the JP's uh, captured buffer tube. Uh, I've used them in the past. There's one in my OG BCM. Uh, does it make a huge difference? I haven't noticed one, but I've talked to other guys who are very reputable who say, yes, it does. So uh, try one if you want. Uh, they're like 120 bucks, I think, $130. So yeah, if it works, it works. Can you go in here for me? <gasps> I think it'll work. Yeah, it'll work. Oh, dude, that's sick. It fits perfectly. Oh, it's also stronger too, because it's like braced right there. All right, that's not gonna lie. That's that's pretty cool. I wasn't sure. It's 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 not sitting perfectly flush, um, but it's good. It's good enough. It'll be fine. Um, so yeah, the M lock light bar on the Centurion Arms rail right there. Boom, set. Oh, that's. I don't know what my next gun's going to be. <laughs> right now, this guy. Uh, FSB guns are fun. So. Um, can you show us your, okay, I don't know what that is, but okay. Uh, definitely one of the nicest, most durable, low profile rail I've ever used. Yeah, I'm surprised by how light, light they are. These are the first rails that I've used from them or have from them now. We haven't taken them out yet, but they're quite lightweight. I, I think they're very cool. Very cool. Um, what hold do you use on pistol to get all good accuracy? Uh, aiming straight at the target. <laughs> No, so I, here's the funny thing with pistol accuracy, and I've been working on this because I, I've been foregoing this important aspect to pistol shooting. It's not so much about your holds with your handgun, because if you're shooting inside of 25 meters, you're just going to aim center and pull the trigger. The, it, the inaccuracies you're going to experience is all going to be with your trigger finger and how you're actually manipulating the pistol and, uh, and disturbing the sights. And this is something that I've been working on that I, I didn't really understand real well previously, uh, and I was struggling with the past year. I focus too much on my dot or on my front sight post when it comes to accuracy. What you need to be doing, and I noticed a huge improvement when I started doing this, you need to focus on a fine aiming point on the target. And it doesn't matter if you're shooting irons or, or with a red dot. If you focus on a fine aiming point of a target, so like the A zone, the center A zone, and you press the trigger when your sights land on that thing, your accuracy goes up quite a bit. Like I, I was surprised how much better I was with my SRO on my uh, Glock 17 when I just started focusing, like trying to burn a hole through the target. And then I literally would just go, sight falls on it, bang. Sight falls, I'm, I'm over exaggerating. I don't actually move the gun around like this when I shoot. But literally as soon as I would arrive there, bang. As soon as I'd arrive there, bang. Kind of like the old tracking point. Don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about. Weird augmented scope thing where you select what you want to shoot and you hold the trigger down. And as soon as the scope like hits that point, the gun fires for you. Don't like that concept very much. 
something from like Call of Duty. But it's sort of the same concept. I have my the aiming point I'm looking at, you know, the head box, the A zone, and as soon as my SRO or my iron sight, because I do a hard target focus, as soon as it lands on top of that, I press the trigger. That's a, a huge benefit to marksmanship and accuracy, especially shooting quickly. Uh, so try that. But don't worry about your holds. If you're shooting inside 25 meters, don't worry about your holds. You don't need to worry about high, low, left, right, you know, unless Kentucky windage, your sights are off or something crazy. Most likely, though, you're wrong. Not the gun. Not, not the stock Glock. You know, 43X shooting left. You're shooting left. You suck. Not that gun. Um, but uh, try that. Try that. You just, just stare at the target. The, the, the tiniest point, everyone's heard aim small, miss small. It's kind of lame, but it's also kind of true. Uh, try that sometime with pistol. It's a huge difference. Uh, pistols are tough. Yep, it's very tough. Very tough. You don't, you're you losing in one entire point of contact, and the gun weighs less than the trigger, uh, trigger weight is. So you have a lot more factors going into shooting a handgun. Mr. Joel Park. He's the one who taught me that, by the way. Uh, man, that was that was great. Spending two days with you, I really, like, my, I lobotomized myself. Actually, you lobotomized me. My brain was just like, just all over the floor. Just gone. All right, so, um, have you had the BCM barrels where else super fast? No, uh, I haven't. I have, uh, my OG BCM has around 20, 20 to 20, 25,000 rounds through it. Uh, it is still getting hits. Uh, I'm sure the barrel isn't as good as it used to be, but I haven't actually like tested like a group with like 77 grain, like match ammo or anything crazy. Um, it also probably depends on if you're using a lightweight, fluted, pencil featherweight barrel versus their like standard cold hammer forged barrel. I would assume that the heavier weight cold hammer forged barrel, you know, may last a little bit longer, especially with like rapid fire and crazy stuff that you're doing and your, uh, your, your, uh, secret ingredient, um, action going on with your low shelf lower. Uh, that standard like barrel may last a little bit longer than your like fluted fancy weird little like thing. I don't do those anymore. I do standard barrels. I'm getting I'm getting fuddy and old, okay? You know, I like front sight posts. I like normal guns. I don't like slide packages anymore. I just want to go back to a carry handle. Okay, I'm kidding. I'm not that I'm not that fud. But uh, it's getting close. It's getting close. Simplicity. Less is more. I still although I will say I still want to have I still want to have a carry handle, but I still have to have an end gall on there. I still got to have the fancy stuff out here, but I can have a carry handle back here. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. It'll be okay. All right. So, can you show us the URGI from the newsletter? I don't know. Can I? Um, yes, I can. It's over here. I, I got it. I got it. It's in this cabinet. So, we sent out a newsletter. Can, uh, can one of you guys tell me what day that went out? Uh, last week. Last week? All right. So we sent out, was that last week? I thought it was, I thought it was on Monday. Maybe it was on like Friday or something. Um, so this is a 14.5 gun. This is a prototype Geisley rail that I got forever ago. Uh, it's actually, you can't actually run a 13.7 on it because it puts the muzzle device uh, too far back, which I know of a rifle company in particular. This is, this is actually a great example of people that don't know what they're doing. Geisley, and this kind of sucks. Geisley, I'm, I'm calling you out. Their Mark 14 rail was originally a 13-inch rail, and you could use it with a 13.7, 13.9 build because there was enough room for your Surefire to sit and have room with the shelf for the QD you know, of suppressors and all that good stuff. Well, recently, the Mark 14 changed to a 13.5 rail. My theory is to work better on a 14.5 barrel because you're like moving the whole thing further out, so you get that really close sort of suppressor lockup you know, with a standard 14.5 barrel because what kind of weirdo wants a 13.7? Well, this guy. So there's a, a company that is selling URGI uppers in the 13.9, 13.7 realm with the new Mark 14 rail that puts the rail hanging over the ledge for the muzzle device. So you can't put a can on the gun because they're doing 13.5 with 13.7. It doesn't work. So that really sucks. Um, and that's a classic, that's a classic example of a, a company either not using their own product and seeing it doesn't work or they maybe didn't notice that the rails that started arriving were a different length, which again, they, I guess, don't have the right people building the guns. Um, but those are little fine details that can make or break like the operationalness of a gun, because now that gun can't be suppressed. It's pinned to you know, that setup, and uh, you can't run it suppressed. So the, the, the buddy that I, or the guy that I know who got screwed over was texting me about it or messaging me about it on Instagram, and 
sent me some photos and I was like, yep, here's exactly what happened. That really sucks. And now he's got to sell that upper because uh, he can't easily modify it because it's been pinned unless he pulls off that uh, rail and finds an older uh, Mark 14 rail uh, to go on the gun. So that's something to keep in mind if you're doing like 13.7s, 13.9s, 14.5s. This rail, uh, the Mark 14 doesn't work anymore. This is a Mark 16, but whatever. So the build is very simple. I have a, it's simple but expensive. Uh, Night Force Attacker 1 to 8, which I have had in the armory now for a couple years, been playing with it a little bit more with this particular gun. Uh, this isn't locked down. Uh, there we go. So my adapter's all over the place. That's really nice. Cool. Um, that kind of sucks, but whatever. Uh, offset Delta Point Pro. Uh, because this scope on 1X, while great, um, the offset red dot is a little bit easier to use, a little more visible than the scope on 1X. Most LPVOs on 1X. Um, I still prefer running an offset red dot. Uh, so that's what I have. I have it flipped on the right side, so when I turn the gun into my body, I have good recoil management, lots of points of contact. Make sure I utilize the riser so the optic sits nice and high. Uh, makes it a little bit easier to get onto. In Gaul, I have an Insight weapon light on here uh, for OG-ness, but the light itself sucks. And uh, it's just on a Colt lower, uh, Geissele trigger. Uh, it's pretty, pretty simple, more or less. It's pretty cool, though. And now I'll just drop it on the ground. Now it's unzeroed. All right. If only handguards could be cut shorter. Uh, yeah, it really sucks to have to do that because then you have exposed, non-anodized metal, and it's disgusting looking, and you have to chop into M-Lock, and yeah, that's, no, that's stupid. You shouldn't have to cut your rail for your gun to make it work. You should be able to go buy the right part in the first place and be squared away. Or the company should know better and build you the rifle that actually works the way it's supposed to work. Like, I'm all, I'm all about DIY. I DIY a lot of stuff. I'm about to DIY my chest rig over here on my plate carrier, make a little modification to the mag pouches. But you shouldn't always have to do that. Companies should know what they need to do to make it work. I'm all about DIY stuff. I do plenty. Trust me. I'll wrap tape around a scope in order to get a... A throw lever to fit on there. That's okay. You know, having the proper throw lever would be nice, but I'll put tape on there and throw that sucker on there like I did on my loophole CQB SS. I've got tape on there with for my uh, throw lever from Vortex. I think I have a loophole scope with a Vortex throw lever, you know, undercooked, overcooked, straight to jail. Uh, it's basically what I have going on on that scope. And so uh, it works. Aero precision. Yes, so we do aero precision lowers on all of our guns. Pretty much all of our guns are aero precision. I to have one upper from them, that's actually this gun right here, which I am planning a video on, <laughs> a little bit of an oxymoron, budget night vision. Is it doable? Is it possible? The answer is budget is relative, like I've talked about in the past, uh, but you can do it for, you know, $4,000 as opposed to $10,000 and, $10, and $15,000. There is a way to do it. So what I'm going to use for that video make sure we're clear because most of these guns are chambered at all times, um, is I have this Aero Precision gun. It's under $1,000 for the whole build. But in order to make the night vision really work, I'm going to be using a PVS-14. You've got to have a laser you know, to accurately shoot. You can't really do passive aiming with a single tube. And if you have a laser-only unit, such as this Hollow Sun that I'm playing with, you've got to have an IR Illuminator, in which case I have the Surefire uh, Vampire M600. So it's a nice little combo I have right up here up top. Laser on one side, uh, M600 on the other, uh, but this is a little bit costly. It's like $1,300 for this whole setup that I have to factor into my night vision overall cost. Then I have an Aimpoint Pro. It's a fairly budget, you know, quality optic, you know, not something super cheap. I could save $300 on this gun if I went cheaper on the red dot, left the A2 grip, that would save 30 bucks, ditch the AFG, and ditch the burn proof cover. This is a YHM can, they're 500 something dollars. 575. Uh, so this entire gun comes in around, I think it was two grand. Two grand for this build right here. Uh, with the suppressor, with the lasers, with the optic. Actually, I think it was like 2300, something like that. Uh, so then I'm going to have a PBS 14, a helmet, all that good stuff. But uh, but then some people are like, well, that's not budget at all. Well, no, this this is budget compared to PEC 15, Surefire suppressor, Aimpoint T2 or EOTech, Geisley trigger inside there, fancier upper, the BCM gun, you know, instead of arrow. Uh, different light on there. Um, yeah, this is actually very budget and, in, 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 you know, compared to what most night vision guns people are building actually like end up looking like and end up being. I mean, my end goal is worth more than this entire setup. They're like $3,000. $500 can. Yep, it's 575 bucks. There's even cheaper cans out there. I will say though, this can, 
It flashes a lot. It's not, it doesn't have good signature. It is fairly quiet, which is nice, but there's a lot of flash from the suppressor. And as some of you guys know, when you're looking for a suppressor, it's not just about the noise you need to be thinking about. It's the entire package. Durability, repeatability, uh, signature reduction, flash, first shot flash, and the sound. A lot of people think it's suppressor, thanks to Hollywood, is silencer. Well, no, it's supposed to suppress my signature, everything else, the flash. You'll see in the video, there's a lot of flash from this particular suppressor. That's not great under nods. How to buy Ingall. Uh, it's tough. There's a lot of night vision dudes out there who uh, have various means of getting them, and that's where you can buy them. Uh, small, some of the small like, night vision companies and stuff. What can? This is a YHM Turbo. I don't think it's a Turbo K. I think the Turbo K is shorter. I think it's just the, uh, the YHM uh, Turbo. This gun actually has some vibe to it. I'm not going to lie. It's kind of cool. It is kind of fat, though, when you look at the top and the bottom. And then all the orange tape, those are uh, the, the price tags, which also has some, like, Battlefield 4 vibe. So I was shooting this the other night. It was actually a lot of fun with a PVS-14. So we're going we're gonna to run around. We're going to run around the woods. We're going to do some driving with a 14, do some content, showing people that you can still do stuff uh, with the monocular uh, if you don't have binos. Although binos are a lot nicer. That's the Turbo K, right? I, I, I think. I don't know. It's the Turbo or the Turbo K. It's the one that's like six inches long. I don't know. Uh, all right. Using the big aperture on your rear sight. Typically speaking, yes. If I'm shooting inside of 100 meters, I'm running the big aperture on my rear sight. Makes it a little bit faster to acquire. It allows you to see a little bit more of the target than the small aperture. If I go past 100 meters, that's where I just go flip, and then I have my small aperture. But again... You should go figure that out for yourself, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, fun trick, if you want to shoot iron sights really fast up close, uh, mount your rear sight, not in the back. Mount it to the front. It's actually faster aligning both when it's further from your eye. There's like a little less play in it. Run the big aperture, and you can kind of treat it like one of those stupid Battlefield 1 artillery sights you can put on uh, bolt guns. <laughs> Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. But a uh, fun little trick if you want to try it, run your rear sight here, front sight in the front, and it's actually really fast um, on the big aperture setting. It's actually pretty cool. If you're like shooting 100 meters in, I mean, I've shot at 100 plus meters with that setup and it still works, uh, but it's quite fast. So, uh, who's waiting on Form 4s? Yeah, I don't know what forms, what the current status is on Form 1s, 4s, 3s, and well, I think 3s are always like four weeks or three weeks from FFL to FFL or whatever. Uh, why not run it directly behind the rear sight? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think run both right next to each other. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, just, just get them right next to each other. But run them both at the front. Yeah, right here. Give it a shot. See how it works. People think that I have to go do it all for them. No, no, no. You go, you go do it. A I actually like AK sights a lot, iron sights a lot. They're great. They're also the best in video games. Um, all right, more questions. NX8. The NX8 has some eye relief issues. I haven't used one a whole lot. I've had them at the range before, and I've kind of messed with them. Um, a lot of people, every NX8 owner that I've talked to has said that they were, uh, they are not blown away by the performance <laughs> uh, with that optic. Now, at the price point that optic came in at, I can kind of understand. Uh, the attacker is the bigger brother to it, and is also like twice the cost. Um, but a lot of people that I know with the NX8 were like, yeah, not a huge fan. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to get something else. Uh, did you have one, Christian? You're nodding your head. An NX8? No, no. No. I'm, oh, okay. I'm reading a comment. Oh, okay, okay. He was nodding like he owned one. I was like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, everyone I've known who's owned one was like, yeah, it wasn't as cool as I thought it would be. You know, good try, Night Force, but you'll you'll do the, you'll we'll get them next time. You know, we'll, we'll, the next one will be good. So um, so I, but I haven't bought went out and bought one mainly because I heard enough of that to be like, eh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play with one. It's like whatever. All right. Does the YHM Turbo uh, the updated flash end cap, Josh. Does it have the updated end cap on the in the front? All right, we'll fix that. I know, what, but I know they still flash even with the updated end cap because I've I've seen those at my range as well. They still flash more than other suppressors, but yeah, with the right end cap, that should be a five five six end cap though on there already. Yeah, but it's not the updated flash cap. Is it any? Is that any better? You know what? Yeah. We'll, we'll see about that. We'll make sure if you can grab one or order one, that'd be that'd be awesome. We'll try we'll try that. Um, what do you think of Crimson Trace? Unfortunately, uh, I think Smith and Wesson owns them now. Is the deal? Um, did they ever make anything that was good? <laughs> um, I'm just asking. 
Because vis visible lasers, I mean, they're, they're bread and butter. Crimson Trace's bread and butter was visible lasers on pistols. But I'll tell you right now, visible lasers on pistol have about this much use. In the day, you're not going to see them. On certain clothing, you're not going to see them. You're not going to see a red laser on this really dark patterned shirt very easily. Uh, you can really only use them at dusk or at night or in a dark building. So in the day, broad daylight, you draw your pistol and you've decided, I'm never going to train with irons because I have a laser on there. I'm going to be Han Solo. Uh, well, now you can't see your aiming system because it's daylight and it's sunny out. Or you're in a structure like, say, a Costco or a Walmart where you have full lights on even though it's 8 p.m. I don't know why it would be open. This is obviously like pre-COVID. But 8 p.m., all the lights are on. You draw your pistol, still can't see the laser. Uh, if you have a red laser, you can barely see it. If you have a green laser, also, you can barely see it. It's a little bit brighter, um, but in day-to-day -day stuff, you know, when you're not just shooting a flat target that's silhouetted with reflective paper, um, you can't see lasers very well, viz lasers. It, uh, depending on what distance you're shooting at, too, uh, when you take a shot with a viz laser, that laser flies, all, just it just flies away. It, it's gone. And then you've got to, like, try to find it back on the target versus sights where I can literally shoot and see my front sight and know exactly where it's going, where it's leaving, and how to get it back into place. With a laser, you can't do that, at least not very easily. So Viz lasers are very much like uh, overrated when it comes to pistol shooting. Now on a rifle, where you need it for signaling or you know something like that, that could be a little bit different. But even then, Viz lasers just kind of suck. <laughs> like there's a lot of clothing that absorbs the light and absorbs the lasers. I mean, if you're wearing a red shirt and someone's trying to you know, shine a red laser at you, well, good luck. Or if you have a green shirt and they're trying to shine a green laser, good luck, or a flannel. So like, why do you think I wear flannels all the time? Laser resistant, a little bit, that's not actually why. But uh, you know, it is a point. So uh, yeah, Crimson Trace, I think uh, one of the big reasons Smith & Wesson acquired them, I could be wrong, uh, is they make some little red dots, I'm pretty sure, that they are putting on the uh, M&P Sport 2s. So you can buy a Sport 2 with a Crimson Trace red dot on it. It's probably like foreign made, like a Hollow Sun style thing. Um, but again, I haven't used those optics, but I'm not expecting them to be drop dead awesome. Josh over here is shaking his head. So uh, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thoughts on panel bridge. Haven't used one, so I can't say anything about it. I've talked to people that think it's cool. I've talked to people who think it's not. I haven't used one. I don't know. Um, just haven't had time to uh, build one out. So yeah, y'all didn't realize that wearing flannels has some good reasons. Yeah, there's some good tactical reasons for wearing a flannel. If you're fighting a bunch of stormtroopers or running Viz lasers, I mean, you're, you're squared away. You're good to go. Green lasers are better, yes, but they're still, they still suck. They still suck unless it's at night or you're in a, like a nightclub or something. They still suck. So um, if you buy Hall Sun, you're communist. I mean, I, you can make that same argument for most of the products that most of us are buying. So I'd say be careful making that argument. I mean, I'm definitely not a big fan of buying from China, but I'd be careful. If you're gonna if you're gonna tiptoe that line, you're gonna have to be pretty consistent with other regimes, other countries, other companies, other products, if you are going to use that line of, of arguing. Now, I don't wanna give the CCP any money if I can help it, but uh, I also have to be consistent in saying that, but still using like iPhones and other, you know, stuff like that. Uh, mostly like chips in our computers, you know. But, and it sucks, because yeah, I don't want to give them money. I don't want to support the CCP, no way. Uh, how much should I spend in night vision? I didn't think this would get turned into night vision, but that we, we get a lot of questions on night vision. So at minimum, you're gonna spend around $3,000 to $4,000, because you have the night vision unit itself, your PBS 14, which you could buy used for two grand, depending on the quality, or buy new for four grand, somewhere in there. But when you're done buying that, you still need a helmet or a skull crusher or a, a cry nightcap, some sort of headborne system, you're gonna need a mount, and then you're gonna need an aiming system for your rifle if you plan on shooting accurately, somehow, if you wanna shoot accurately. Maybe it's just for observation and you can just wear it around your neck and then look through it and then go to your rifle and run white light. Hey, that, that could be an option. But at minimum, you know, a bump helmet for 60 bucks, you know, could be an airsoft one or potentially, or a, an older ProTac, and then a, a rhino mount, you know, an issued, you know, fell off of a truck rhino mount for 50 bucks or 40 bucks uh, with, you know, a $50 helmet, that's $100. Then you have the night vision that's like three grand, so that's $3,200. Then you have a laser for $800, like this one. Uh, we're, we're now sitting at four grand. That's like minimum to get into night vision, a PVS 14 green tube, used, new, you know, it's about four grand to get into with the, uh, with the support stuff. 
So passive aiming is an option, not with a single tube, not very easily. Uh, the problem with passive aiming with a single tube is generally speaking, you wear the single tube on your left eye, right? Well, if you're a right-handed shooter, where's your optic? It's on the right side. So literally getting your head down into here, like, so I'll aim at you, right? I'm a right-handed shooter. I got the monocular on this side. Going to here and looking through my monocular and my Aimpoint Pro, uh, not great. It actually really sucks. I was trying it the other night again, and I was like, this is garbage. Passive aiming with a single tube is almost impossible. So I was shoulder bumping to this side, and even then, I'm... All I could see is this, and I'm filling most of that with my optic. So now I'm actually having to hunt through my optic. I don't have my other eye assisting me, and it's, it's a pain. The reason passive aiming works so well with binos is one tube occupies the red dot, this tube occupies everything else that I'm seeing, the target, the environment, and then I can just put that dot wherever I want and just go to town. But with a single tube, it absolutely sucks. We'll do some videos though and show you guys what it looks like, but it sucks, it, it really does. Uh, that's why I recommend a laser if you have a single tube, you know, for 800 bucks. If you have duals, you should actually have both, but then passive aiming is much more viable. That's because you're left eye dominant. Um, now I'd wear left eye anyway. Um, okay, still going, through, still going down. I just flagged you with an invisible rifle. Absolutely. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, or is it flagging? Oh, this is a big hypothetical. Is this flagging? If I aim this upper at you? Yeah. Ah! What? <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> That's the real hypothetical right there. Is it flagging if you use an upper or a Glock slide without the frame attached? I'll let you all answer that. I'm not going to get into that. I have my own theories and opinions, but I'll let you all handle that. All right, so. <laughs> yeah, That's exactly how we get kicked off. Oh, I can't aim because the camera. Um, so anyway, it's good fun. Uh, do EOTEX with green reticles any good? I haven't used one, so I don't know. Uh, I've heard green is awesome. I've also heard that green isn't. And I've heard that red is great, and red has been used for a long time. Um, so I don't know. I need to get one at, at some point. Rifle competition at T-Rex. Uh, I think our next uh, company match is uh, at night, actually. And it's either going to be rifle, pistol, or it might all be pistol. I'm not sure yet. Um, but it's going to be a night match, and that's going to be great. Um, uh, green EOTech is nice, but no night vision. Oh, it doesn't have a night vision setting. Oh, that really sucks. Oh yeah. So for those of you that don't know, this is probably the most disappointing thing of my entire career. So the EOTech EXPS3 and the XPS3 or two has this cool little button here, Charles, if you want to zoom in on this guy that says NV on it, which obviously stands for, uh, not vegan, or I mean, it stands for night vision, but, um, when you click on this button, you don't see night vision. It's very disappointing. The reticle just disappears and you have nothing. I, we get a lot of emails from people actually asking what this does for whatever reason. They think it actually turns on like night vision mode. It doesn't. It just makes your reticle dim. So under night vision, you have a crisp reticle and it is crisp. This is the crispest passive aiming option on the market. And that's part of just the holographic technology, like how low they can dim it while still having a super refined image. Plus you have really clear glass, which is great when you're already looking through it with a tube that can't see very much. Um, so the EOTech's what I recommend for passive aiming, but no, it's not actually a night vision optic. So that kind of sucks, but uh, it is what it is. T-Rex range live stream when? We will live stream at the range when Mr. Musk gets us our satellite up and running. Uh, but until then, we can't stream there. We have his uh, satellite link or whatever that thing is called. The thing that jacks into your, jacks into your spine and goes up to the satellite. Um, yeah, that thing, however that works, right? Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, we're waiting on that. And then when we have that, we should have good enough. Uh, Skynet. Skynet, yeah. Oh, shoot. Uh, <laughs> as soon as we have that, we should be able to stream at the range. And I'm looking forward to that. Twitch, Instagram, YouTube, uh, provided they allow gun handling. So it'll be great. Um, I got catfished by EOTech. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Uh, rugged suppressors. I haven't used them a whole lot. I do have a 9mm can from them, and it's been enjoyable, uh, but I don't have their 5.56 cans or 7.62 cans. I still want to go out and get a suppressor from every company and put them on our, uh, our Mark 18s or, or something like similar, and actually, like, we're not going to run tests like Pew Science. He's doing great work, but just shoot with them and see what the shootability of them is like. Under nods, uh, recoil, uh, back blast, you know, all that good stuff. Muzzle device, 
You know, companies need to be testing muzzle devices, in my opinion, just as much as the suppressor. Because not all muzzle de devices are created equal. Like, there's a reason I really like Surefire cans, because I also really like Surefire muzzle devices. They work really well. The three-prong, one of the best out there. But there's some suppressor companies that focus so much on the can that then when they make the muzzle device, it's like, ah, just throw some ports on it and eh, have the locking system and ah, it'll be all right. It'll be okay. Like, it'll be all right. But it sucks as a muzzle device when you pull the can off. Um, so I really do think people need to, um, need to think about the muzzle device, I would say almost as much as the suppressor itself. Because the suppressor is not going to necessarily live on there all the time, forever. Although it might if it's like a dedicated like uh, SD like rail goes over it and all that good stuff. Uh, fastest you've ever gotten a suppressor uh, with or without the secret ingredient? <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, we have an SOT, so we're able to get suppressors pretty quickly, which is convenient for testing. But I'll be honest, it's stupid that we can get that and you guys can't. Like. People who have SOTs need to be calling out how stupid it is that they can have an SOT and get all this cool stuff and everyone else has to wait 10 months. And I've waited, I, I've done my fair amount of time waiting on suppressors. My first suppressor order with Surefire was uh, many uh, suppressors and I waited, I think, uh, 10 months for some and I waited six months for others. It was actually pretty quick uh, a few years ago. But uh, SOTs and people who have like the, the special privileges of the state, um, a lot of them, and this is really sad in the industry, people with transferable machine guns, people with SOTs, like the exclusivity of having those privileges over you all. And it's disgusting. In fact, it's, it's deplorable is really what it is. Um, and I've seen those people, and I've talked to those people, and I've seen them on Instagram. Uh, they know that their investment in their $60,000 M16 or their belt-fed machine gun is going to drop to nothing except for the collector value if the NFA is repealed. So they have no interest in repealing the NFA. But the reality is every single person should be desiring that, that everyone can get those freedoms back. So I don't like that we have to have an SOT in order to quickly get suppressors and make SBRs, which that shouldn't even be a thing anyway, uh, or machine guns for that matter. It's stupid. It's asinine. Like, why should we have to do that? It actually, like, it, it really ticks me off is what it does. Um, but yes, we do have that privilege. We are able to get suppressors within uh, like three weeks, four weeks of ordering. That can be really convenient, uh, but I absolutely hate it that we can get that and you all can't. It's stupid. I hate it. You would be, you would be surprised how many people out there really like their special privileges of owning machine guns and you all can't. There's a lot of people out there and it's disgusting. All right. Um, that's my rant for the evening. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to get an SOT. They have, they have uh, crack down on hobby FFLs. They want to see a business reason uh, to, for you to have an FFL. So you're demoing stuff to law enforcement, you're selling guns, you're, you're doing something. Um, you can't just go get an SOT with your buddies, mark it at your house, which is also stupid because then they can like raid your house to check in on it. Um, and then just like buy some saws. Uh, they cracked down on that a few years ago. You've got to have a legitimate like business reason to have that. So that's kind of doesn't really work anymore. Um, so yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, more, more questions, more questions. We're going through. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Thoughts on the rare breed. So if, for those of you who don't know, rare breed is currently in a lawsuit with the ATF. Um, I kind of called it, I think everyone did. The FRT trigger is one of the only binary triggers that like is good because it actually more or less operates as a uh, a, a rapid fire trigger. You know the rapid fire perk in Call of Duty you can put on guns? It's basically what the FRT does. Just really fast, angry splits. Well, the problem is the ATF and all of their wise knowledge saw what they were doing with this rapid fire trigger and decided it's too much like full auto. It's close, but it's not exactly full auto. Uh, so they told the FRT, uh, Rare Breed, hey, you need to stop making this. Rare Breed fi fired back, I want to say, with a lawsuit. I'm like 99% sure they're in a lawsuit. Someone here can probably confirm that. And uh, they're fighting this fight against, um, against uh, the ATF. Now, another company just came out with a similar trigger that appears to be a direct copy. And uh, it's, a little, it's, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit lame and shady because they're not the ones being attacked by the ATF. They're letting Rare Breed deal with the ATF with the lawsuit. While this company over here makes a similar product that's literally like the same design and gets to collect money off of it while not like pitching in to help with the lawsuit. If they pitched in to help with the lawsuit and fighting the ATF over it, that would be pretty awesome. Uh, but it appears they're not doing that. 
I could be wrong, uh, but based on what I've seen out there and what people are saying, uh, that's not happening at all. It's just some shady business practices, and that really sucks. Um, but rare breed, I really hope that goes, uh, the lawsuit and everything goes well. Um, the more pressure we can put on the ATF, the better. I will say this year we have seen more pressure and acknowledgement of the ATF and who they are and what they're doing by uh, politicians and just people in general than we've ever had before. I think it's actually awesome how many people now know who the ATF are and are actually concerned about what the ATF is doing. And I want to say it's GOA just got, uh, they through the Freedom of Information or whatever, just demanded all of the ATF st uh, SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures, and the ATF just turned those over to them and they're like going through them or whatever. So uh, the amount of pressure being put on the ATF right now is really good and just like knowledge that they exist and what they do or what they don't do. And uh, we'll see what happens in the next year or two. But uh, we will see what happens. But the FRT looks really cool for what it is. If you want to build a civilian saw, which I've been wanting to do, I just haven't had time to go out and do that. 18 inch heavy barrel, 20 inch heavy barrel. Basically build an IAR, put that trigger in there. Magpul D60 so you could shoot from prone, add a bipod, uh, magnified optic or a red dot, or even iron sights. You know, if it's a suppressing fire weapon, you don't necessarily need like a really awesome sighting system. And uh, you've got a civilian saw, little like mini saw which is pretty cool. Uh, I think that's really awesome. So, uh, let's see, da, 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 da. Uh, I'm just getting emails coming in of stuff. You should do an M27. I would like to, that's a like a $6,000 gun to build um, or more to do it right. Uh, there's another gun I'm actually hoping to build soon. Um, it's a little different, similar, but different, but we'll see. I'd like to do an M27 though and put the BCOG on it. So, uh, more comments, more questions. Is flexible body armor any good? Um, look at the testing and see if actual tests are being done to it. Magpul bipods, I haven't heard the best things, but I haven't used one, but people have talked about them. And again, kind of like the NX-8, they expected big things that came out. People were like, eh, whatever. Um, I use Harris bipods, they're cheap, they work. Lots of people use them. The Atlas is another good one. I would like to get one. I just haven't gone out and bought one. They're like $260, I think. Uh, and they're super durable. Uh, I've seen those on a lot of guns. Um, FRT doesn't violate. Yeah, it's great. The ATF loves to run around and uh, create law apart from due process and just run around and do stuff. Oh, and I want to tell you all a fun story um, that, you know, we need to not forget uh, that the NRA and their also infinite wisdom uh, called on the ATF. Uh, I guess it was five. Uh, how many years ago was it? Two years ago, uh, three years ago, uh, called on the ATF to regulate bump stocks apart from law, skipping due process after the October 1 shooting. I just want to make sure that people don't forget that. Like they literally, you could find their letter that they had on their website that literally said at the bottom of it, we call upon the ATF, I'm paraphrasing, we call upon the ATF to regulate this piece of equipment. So they're like bypassing Congress and Senate and all that good stuff. They're like, hey, ATF, y'all can make the rules. And that was the NRA who you guys give money, some of you all, not all of you, some of you all give money to and think they're doing good work are literally encouraging the ATF to make rules apart from law. So that's our, that's our, uh, our uh, gorilla in the room, or however they say it about the NRA, uh, fighting for us. Yeah, good fun, isn't it? Uh, el I think it's the elephant. elephant in the room? No, it's, it's, the, it's the, no, the term that people use for the NRA. It's something about the biggest gorilla. They're, we have to keep giving them money because they're the biggest gorilla in the room. Gotcha. Yeah, I can't remember the term. But also, they're an elephant. They're also an elephant. You're not surprised. They also take credit for all the other successes of everyone else. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Uh, <laughs> I think y'all can tell where some of my biases or lack thereof lie. <laughs> I make it I make it pretty clear. So, uh, more 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 comments. NRA is a joke. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good fun. It's good fun. Uh, it's about every anti-gun agenda. Yep. Oh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, from a business standpoint, they're doing a great job. I'll tell you how. This is uh, you can make a movie about this. If you are a, a rights organization and you need money to survive, 200 million a year, whatever it is, the NRA makes an insane amount of money every year, and you need that money to keep coming in, you need sales, you need customers, you need orders to come in, you make sure there's enough antithesis, so there's enough customer demand, supply and demand, right? You have to have enough antithesis of anti-gunness out there so that people will still be scared and give you money. Because if all the gun rights go away, you don't need an organization like the NRA. Then that 200 million can go down to 20 million and then like 2 million and then like $2,000 because, well, we don't need it anymore. We have all the rights back. 
So it's in the NRA's best interest as a money organization to maintain some sort of antithesis so they can keep guilt tripping people into giving the money so that they can protect the NR to protect the Second Amendment. Like that that's that's how it works. And it's 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 horrible. Uh, but as far as, as business practices goes, uh, they're doing a great job <laughs> at maintaining that money. <laughs> it's starting to go away because people are starting to figure it out. But uh, that's it's the strategy. It's the business strategy. So uh, what is your take on uh, micro Ronies and other like little pistol thingies and stuff? Yeah, so a couple of years ago, I want to say it was two or three years ago, a huge craze of PDW style guns. And basically what those are, are glocks with frames that you put the glocks into and turn them into a rifle. Uh, this concept isn't new. There's been a number of these over the years. Um, BNT's got a really good one that I've got. You've got CAA, uh, or whatever their name is, and Israel making them, the, the Roni kits. Uh, you've got the new Flux system that's built around the 320, but I think they also have a Glock one. I could be wrong, though. I think it's mainly 320. You have a lot of these little, like, little pistol things. That, uh, they're trying to make it into some machine guns. They are cool, uh, especially for, I would say, for beginner shooters, because you get that extra point of contact, and you can hand that gun to a new shooter who's never shot, like, a pistol, and they can make hits to 25 meters. You hand them a handgun, not necessarily. Now, an experienced shooter, are, is, are they getting, you know, that amount of benefit compared to a beginner with one of those systems? In my opinion, no, they're not. I can shoot a handgun at 25 meters just fine without the little thingy. Now, can I do it quicker with this? Yes. But the disparity of benefit is not as much with one of those little compact little PDW kits for an experienced shooter. Um, I would recommend you do something like a 300 blackout instead that's got more stopping power, um, that has like better rounds, better capability, than focusing so much on the little cool, like little weird PDW type guns. But for newer shooters, uh, or say a police department where they don't train their guys and they're like, we want to give you a gun that lets you shoot 25 meters if you need to, or take that hostage, you know, HR shot if you have to, because you're untrained because you suck and we know you suck. Um, yeah, I think that could actually be, uh, not a bad option, but for experienced shooters who know what they're doing, uh, I don't think they're quite as viable, um, but fight me. Um, I, I just don't think they're quite as viable. And I've got some nice ones. I've got the USW, the BNT one. That one's really great, although you can't mount a, a peck to it, which is kind of sad. And then I've got the other one by Fab Defense, which you can mount a peck to, but it's also kind of big and weird. So, you know, uh, they look cool, absolutely. <laughs> they do look cool. Uh, one of those in a 10 mil would actually be pretty awesome. Because here's the thing with 9 mil. 9 mil doesn't recoil at all, so whether you're shooting it from here or from here, it's no big deal. But yeah, 10 mil. A 10 mil version could actually, or a 357, actually, you know what? A 357 SIG version, because that's super snappy. 357 uh, SIG Glock, which SIG Glock, isn't that funny? A 357 SIG Glock in one of those frames could actually be kind of dope. That could actually be really cool. Maybe that's the play. Maybe that's the meta. I don't know. 10 mil could be cool as well. But uh, I just think those guns are getting really hyped up. And uh, I, I, th I think they are cool for what they do. But what they do is like this much of the grand scheme of things. So, uh, Elvwav. Eh, it's in a cage somewhere. Eh, it's whatever. Um, all right. Scrolling down, scrolling down. Um, SR-15. Knight's Armament guns are, well... They're good, although a couple of my buddies who bought them recently had to send them back for work, so... Eh. But uh, they're good guns historically, or they still are good guns. Uh, you're just going to pay for the name. My recommendation, if you want to buy an AR-15, I say this on every stream when I'm asked, I say this all the time, and I'm not paid to say this either. I actually make zero money off of recommending this. You'll get a BCM upper for $800 to $900. You'll buy an arrow lower. I also don't make money off of them either for 250 bucks to the $300, depending on what you buy, and you slap those together. And what you're doing is you're bypassing the federal excise tax because you're only taxed on the gun part, so the lower for that $250, and the upper can ship straight to your door. So that's what you do to save money. It's like 1,050 bucks, and you have essentially a grade A gun, which you can then upgrade. You can add a Geisley trigger to it. You can add a better grip to it. You can add different stock to it, you, or brace, or put a stock on the brace, uh, who cares? Uh, you could then change your muzzle device. You can then add your, your red dot, and your, your laser, and your fake laser, and your fake irons, and you know, all that cool stuff. But that's what I recommend, is that right there. And I've got one around here somewhere, we're building out, we're gonna do some videos and stuff. Um, the other gun that I just uh, 
Another recommendation, potentially, you know, is uh, this right here. I bought this Colt 6920 FSP carbine length uh, gun for, uh, you buy these for like $680. Pulled the plastic handguards, got this uh, Centurion Arms rail, M-Lock. We're gonna slap that on there, free float, for, I'm gonna be at 900 something bucks for this upper. Then I can slap this guy on my arrow lower and I'm at 1100 and I have a Colt 14.5 uh, for about the same money as the BCM. But there's lots of great ways of building like cheap-ish guns that still have good capability, uh, provided you're willing to get creative and not buy a gun that's all complete. Don't go and buy and don't, whatever you do, if it makes you happy, do what makes you happy. But if, if you don't need it, don't buy signature rifles with people's names on them. You're paying extra money for no benefit. Just don't do that. Just go get an arrow lower and a BCM upper, tape over the logos if you want and you're done. All right, and BCM does have stock because I've been looking at their website because I've been snapping a couple things up here and there. Uh, they do have stock, they have stuff that's in stock. So no complaints. Where's BCM in stock? On their website. <laughs> uh, their key mod uppers are in stock uh, pretty often. And then uh, their QRF uppers aren't. And their MCMR rails have been in stock more recently. Chad, what are you, what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing? Okay. He's giving me the signal. He's giving me, he's over there with his cards for like how many minutes left? Like five minutes, 10 minutes. So. Springfield Saint. I've got a couple. I'm looking forward to shooting them. They're basically like budget BCMs, but I haven't had time to mess with them. But they seem pretty cool. Um, but we'll, we'll see. What parts of an AR can you be cheap with? Uh, I mean, it depends. What are you trying to do with it? <laughs> um, you want a good bolt normally. Uh, you can go cheap with like the charging handle. With the, uh, the charging handle. And, but everything else, I mean, ultimately, you do want the other stuff to be nice. Uh, that's why I recommend BCM, because they do a good job. They've got great bolts. Uh, they've got great everything else. Their tolerances are awesome. Um, that's why I recommend BCM. Um, you know, then you can, like, maybe go cheaper with, like, some of your accessories, like your light, and get, like, a Streamlight or something, or, like, an Aimpoint Pro instead of a T2. You know, that's $440 versus, like, $800. Um, but as far as the rifle goes, I mean, I, I would put money into the gun, and then slowly upgrade for optics. And here's what people, here's what a lot of folks don't understand. They come into this stream and they see that I'm surrounded by all these nice, lovely, expensive gadgets that are worth a lot of money, right? And they think, wow, I need to own all of this all at once. And the answer is absolutely not. Go buy what you can afford right now. Have a roadmap for what you want in the, at the end, upgrade as you go, and spend what you can afford. When I first started doing this back in 2013, I had a DPMS, FSP 16 inch gun with a $30 light on it and a Trijicon reflex from my older brother that I thought was the coolest thing ever, even though it was like already at its half life and you could barely see the reticle. Uh, then like a year or two later, I slowly started upgrading. Actually, I traded that gun for a dirt bike, got a new gun. It was a VTAC 16 inch long boy rail, slowly upgraded that, then sold that, then got my BCM, slowly upgraded that. It took me years before I even had a laser to go on the gun. I mean, I didn't go out and buy everything all at once. I bought stuff as I went. And a lot of people out there think they need to go straight to this. And it's like, well, no, you don't have to do that. Buy the gun first, get sights, then get a weapon light, get a sling, uh, save up, then get an optic, save up, then change the rail, save up, then maybe get a Geisley trigger, then save up, maybe sell the upper, get a new one, throw it on your lower. Or maybe a different upper, like a 300 blackout to put on there. You, you don't have to do it all at once. Yeah, expectations. Anyway, don't you don't have to buy everything all at once. Although it's way cooler if you do. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, it is cooler. But you save up and buy what you can afford, and then slowly upgrade and have a plan. You know, like if you want, if you want like a really cool gun like this, uh, you know, have a plan for it. Go, okay, well, I can buy the BCM upper. I can do that. I can buy the arrow lower. Uh, I could start with like irons. I can train with irons, get really good with irons. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, a big respect to people who are going to train with irons before they go to, you know, the, the future is now. And then get the future is now, get the ACOG, then get the RMR. You know, you've already had a light because you know you have to have a light, you know, early on so you can properly identify stuff. You already have the sling because they're very inexpensive. And then when you get night vision, you get the laser. So you build this gun out over the course of like two years and you know what you want when you're done. That's, that's, the, that's the real play right there is you want to have that financial planning. But anyway, well, guys, 
it's been a lovely time. We're here at about an hour. Uh, I would like to try to answer more questions. I think next week, actually next week, I know exactly what we're talking about next week. Next week, we're talking a little bit more about rifle upgrades and something that uh, we're, we're bringing to the market to help save you guys some money. Again, going back to financial planning, uh, that's going to be next week on next week's live. So we're going to talk about that a little bit and uh, answer more questions you all have. I know I can't go through a ton of questions in here within an hour, um, but I'll see you guys then. And I appreciate you guys sticking around and uh, have some questions ready for next week. And I'll try to get to them. See y'all later.